All right, well, welcome back to this net last semester that we have. It'll be going through until about the middle of December. Um, this semester, if you guys aren't aware, we're gonna be studying marketing, pitching, and script analysis. With the marketing, it's a little bit going to be about um, like how businesses market, but a lot of it can be applied to film as well and the stuff that can't, we'll be discussing that during the, the meetings and throughout the semester. But a lot of the things that they use in marketing, um, some of the terms they have aren't really used in film. Like one of the things we'll talk about today is what is called the USP in marketing, which is a unique selling point. And typically we call that a film hook, like what hooks the interest of the, the viewers or the, or, or the um, investors to your film. So it's like some of the different terminology will be a little bit different depending on if it's for business or if it's for a film. But most of it can be applied, especially if you are trying to market your film because a lot of independent films are basically going to be a business on their own. It's going to be like if you were starting a business and you were trying to run it with each film you make, it's like a new business that you've created because you have to get the financing and the funding and then you have to create it and then you have to try to market it out there to get people interested in it. And then you have to distribute it in some form. So there's a lot of different things that are basically the same as if you were starting a new business. And so that's why a lot of the marketing things apply to both. With script analysis, we're gonna be taking it a little bit slower. We're gonna be going through like one thing at a time and focusing on it. And then we'll come back and have a, um, a look at it all together. We're gonna to have a, the exercises this semester, one's going to be about script analysis. One's going to be about creating a website for either your brand, your production company, yourself, or your film and um, creating social media pages for that same thing, whether it's a film, a company, yourself as a creative and things like that. And um, the last one, what is the last one? One will be script analysis where we'll have a scene and we'll try to like analyze everything and come together and um, discuss what we analyzed, what we came to and what we thought the characters were like based on our own analysis. We'll be watching two films this semester as well. They'll both be independent films that were successful enough to either break even or have a little bit of extra money um, to have some kind of profit. They're not huge films. I've never heard of them before. I've never heard of the companies either, but it just shows that independent films can be successful in their own way. And uh, usually you're not really gonna know what they are. And uh, we're gonna look into all the stuff that they did to make it successful, like their website, their Twitter page, their Facebook, how did they market it? The budget will be kind of hard to find. I couldn't really find the budget on either one of them, but we'll kind of have some guesstimates or something and look at everything else they did to make it successful and how, how they made it work. And for that, um, I was also looking through a few independent films that are more recent that I could find the budget of. I forgot to tell you about that. Oh, cool. I found a few, and even if we don't end up like watching them, we can show like, hey, these are some low budget independent films that were shot recently that were successful or won awards or went, you know, were semi like viral, and these are their budgets. Okay, cool. Yeah, that yeah, so we'll be discussing that and just because we're really looking at it from an independent standpoint this semester. Since, you know, if you are with a big company, they're going to handle the marketing. They're going to handle the pitching and all of that. Well, you'll handle the pitching, but if you are getting in with a big company, you're probably going to have a sales agent or somebody that's helping you get in with that company. So a lot of the stuff, some of it will apply. A lot of it won't if you have a big funding and big company behind you. There's a lot more for independent films this semester because we have to look at it from that standpoint. Um, the other exercise is a pitch deck exercise. So we'll be putting together our own pitch decks based on an idea or something we give out. And then we'll all come together and show like what that would be like, and then discuss um, how sellable that was. Uh, other than that, I think everything else is basically the same as it usually is every semester. Um, near the end, we're gonna just be going over the 
entire uh, group, like all of the semesters. At the very end of this semester, we're going to be talking about not just this semester stuff that we learned, but everything else. And so it'll be a little bit of a culmination of everything and the quiz. There'll be a quiz for this semester, but then there'll be one for the overall um, two years that we've all been studying this stuff together. So that'll be fun. And then we'll just have a conversation about what we're doing next and what our future plans are at the end. So, all right. I think I went over everything with that. So first thing we're gonna talk about today is what is script analysis? This stuff comes from letter B in the syllabus from backstage.com. Script analysis is used by um, mostly directors, actors, and production designers so that they can find the characters and create things around that. The director needs to know inside and out the characters, the script, why things are happening, the point of view from all the characters the director should know so that they can discuss that with the actors. Some directors will do the script analysis on their own and then also do another script analysis with the actors. Some will try to wait and do most of it for the characters anyway. They'll wait and see if they can do it with the actors so that they don't have any pre-assumptions about what the character is and they wanna hear what the actor thinks. Um, and some will kind of let the actors do it, bring it to them and then discuss. So it's a little bit of a difference, but most, most directors will do a script analysis beforehand and bring it to the actors so that they have an understanding of the script. So that if any questions come from the actors about, well, why is my character doing this? Or I don't know, this doesn't really make sense. Like, how did they get here? And then the director can explain, well, you know, they probably have a car, they probably have a plane or something like that. That's how they got there. Script analysis is a lot about filling in what isn't in the script. It's about what finding what is in the script and writing that down, keeping it in your notes, making sure you have all the background information that is stated in the actual script. But it's also about finding the stuff that isn't there, filling in the blanks. How did they get there? Why are they thinking this? What in their past that is in the script makes this part of their conversation make sense? What do they want out of this conversation? That kind of stuff. All right, so from backstage.com, script analysis is a close reading of the script to establish its intended meaning. Getting a thorough understanding of the setting, the subtext, and character objectives. Script analysis is done by production designers to understand the characters in the setting, emotion, and tone to match the look of the film to its themes, tones, and character's emotion with each moment. Script analysis is also done by directors to understand the overall setting, story, and characters inside and out to help directors to help to direct the actors and make decisions on shots, music, props, costumes, sets, design, and et cetera. Script analysis is also done by the actors to know their character inside and out and have a better understanding of who their character is and what they want overall, as well as in each moment and encounter. Sometimes script analysis of an actor is not done beforehand if requested so that it can be a more collaborative effort between the director and actors during table reads and rehearsals. So sometimes it'll be like a director will request the actors not to do a script analysis before they meet with them. That way the director has already done their script analysis and they want the actor not to have their own ideas in their mind because the director already has an idea of what they want the character to be. But they also want to have a collaborative effort with the actors when they do the table reading and the rehearsals and that's when they'll discuss um, who their character is and why they're doing what they're doing. And then, you know, either, either say, try to like convince them of their own ideas of what the character is to have them, the actors come around to that idea or to hear the actors out and kind of change their own interpretation of who this character is based on what the actors think. Other times script analysis will be done by everyone individually. And then they come together to hash it out and to have a discussion about who's like which way to go with it and the director is usually the one to make the final say and well I get that you want it to be this way but this is the way that it makes sense to the script overall because the director can't just look at it on one character by character basis 
but you have to also look at it based on the entire script. This next stuff comes from braindance.org. It's letter A in the syllabus. If they say you usually want to start by reading the script for pleasure before analyzing it. Read it as you would a book or a story. You kind of want to see what's interesting about it, what the, where the hook is, and that kind of stuff. So if you're analyzing each individual thing, you're not going to get the same sense of the story as you would if you just read it like you were reading a book. So they say, you know, the first time, read it just to read it, just to see what the, what is the script, what is it about, what is the story here. Then sometimes you will read it again and again just to understand it in a further, deeper level before you start analyzing each individual part of the script. And that'll give you a better understanding overall, especially when you start to do the script analysis. Then when you're reading through it again, you can start to analyze it. Keep an open mind and have possibilities instead of one definitive option, especially for choices and reasoning not specified directly in the script. So one thing that I've seen a lot of directors, even big time directors do is like, they'll have an idea of, of what this choice means, why this character chooses to do this and they don't hear anything else out. They don't think of any other considerations of what, what else could it be? What are the possibilities to this? Since it's not stated in the script, there are many possibilities to it, which we will all find out later in the semester when we do the exercise. We'll all have the same script, but sometimes you're gonna to come to different conclusions because you have this different set of backstory that isn't stated in the script uh, in your head. You have a different reasoning in your head for why somebody might do something. So it's really good for a director, especially to keep an open mind and not really lock it down to one reasoning. Because if the actor doesn't agree with it, it even if they come around to it, it still makes it a little bit harder to get it through to them and get them to be the character that, direct, that, that the director wants. It's a lot easier to have a collaborative effort with it and to hear the actor out and then just try to reason with them to get them to come around to what the director thinks than just to be like, no, that's not the way it is. This is the way it is. So it's, uh, it's good to be open-minded about it. Hey, Zary, were you going to say something? Uh, no. Oh, okay. You just turned your mic on. Oh, I thought it was on mute, so I was just... Oh, gotcha. Somebody did something on my work. Okay. If a character arrives home, how did they get there? A car is the most obvious answer, but that doesn't always mean it's the only one. Maybe they took a bus, a train, a cab, maybe they did an Uber, or maybe they walked. Did, or maybe, you know, did they whip out a skateboard and come home on that? How might those changes change the character and the setting? Obviously, you know, the skateboard is the most crazy um, choice, but that really would sort of change how you view the character. And that's not even in the script. So that could just be like starting to make a character based on that information. And then the rest of their choices line up with whatever choices you're making that aren't outside of the script, which is all, which is the main reason what um, you do script analysis is to find all that information. This is why having an open mind with possibilities is important because the character we think of with all of those changes that aren't even in the script begin to shape who they are and what is going on around them. If they didn't take a car, why not? Do they not have a car? Can they not afford it? Is that played somewhere else in the script that they are, um, they are poor, that they don't have much financing? Or is somebody else using the car? And how might that change who this character is compared to, did they come in a limo? Did they come in, did somebody drive them there? Did they take an Uber? And uh, that's just more, well, some of those are more average than, than the rest. So all those different choices will sort of shape your character in a different way. And that's why it's important to Think of these, but also think of multiple possibilities. Question everything in the script and things that are left out, whether intentionally or by mistake. So if things aren't in the script, if they're intended to not be in the script because it's a sort of mystery or it's just not important to the script itself, 
that doesn't mean you don't want to question it of why, how, when, where, and what. You always want to question everything in the script when you're doing an analysis so you can find all of the answers to everything and know the script and the characters to the fullest extent. It also helps so the scenes flow better together because it doesn't feel choppy or like the scene's missing or like how they got to point A to point B. And there's like a cool chunk of information we don't have. Yeah, like it just has, it doesn't feel like we're missing anything when we're the viewers of the movie because the director thought of it or the actor thought of it and brought it up to the director and said, hey, you know, like, or sometimes the production designer will too. This doesn't really make sense because it was morning whenever they started the script. And now it's like, it feels like it's two hours later, but it's nighttime. So it's it feels like we're missing so that, time. Even if that you kind of do, stuff. It's also so that even if you do need to cut scenes, it doesn't feel choppy because it's still maintaining the storyline and it's still able to interconnect with, yeah. in a cohesive way. Even if you are the writer and the director, you want to detach yourself from what you wrote this story to be and you want to read it as if you are the first, you're just now the um, first seeing it. You want to read it for what it is in its current state that will help you find plot holes and issues that you can work to fix, making a better, tighter story. Mostly because you as the creator, as the writer, you know what you're trying to say, you know the, you know the story you're trying to tell, you know where this scene is heading, but as like a blind reader, a blind viewer won't be able to do that. Like they don't know where you're going with the story. They don't know what this is supposed to symbolize or mean. So. You need to be able to go into it like, oh, if I didn't know where this was going, would I still be able to, would it still feel like it makes sense? Would it, does it still um, add to the story? Does it still feel like, like it needs to be there? Does it still, is it still written well? You know, um, does it feel forced? Does it feel overly obvious is this a little too on the nose is this not enough so all of those things are important um and so it's important for us to remove our biases remove our 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 uh, knowledge our all our early knowledge of this story and our preconceptions of the story and look at it from an outsider's perspective someone reading it for the first time someone watching it for the first time yeah, and that's hard to do because you already know what you were trying to go for, so you automatically start seeing that. Um, but it is something that you want to try to do as best you can because you want to make sure that others can see the same thing. And the Frankly, reasoning that you thought in your head when you're writing the story out, the background information that's not in the script because you just automatically assumed it, that stuff, you want to make sure that you think about that as a possibility, but also just as a possibility because the stuff that isn't in the script can always be something else. Frankly, this is just me personally, but I am the kind of person that I am, I overanalyze things and I can, and things to me sometimes seem obvious that another person was like, how did you get there? Not that I'm smarter than other people, that's not what I'm saying, but like my brain works a little different. So because my brain works different, it connects dots differently than another person's brain would connect dots. So. If you can, if you have someone that you trust, I would recommend whether it be like someone in your production, someone that's working with you on the project to have that outsider's perspective, um, to have like a third party or even someone you trust, a family member, a friend or whatever, to read it and then give you feedback as well. Because I feel like there's no such thing as a completely unbiased opinion or a completely um, un, like a completely raw, reaction or reading to something that you created or something that you know well um so it, i in my personal opinion if you can't have a third person like a third party unbiased person quote unquote i would recommend that as well as you reading it as someone who like doesn't know the project because there's always going to be things that for you are obvious in your brain connect and for another viewer might not Right. And so that will be, um, if you are the script writer, that you should definitely be doing that while you are writing the script, while you are or vice versa. Like the you first think it's or obvious. second or third draft, 
you want to make sure to get other people involved so you can change the script. By the time you get to script analysis, you shouldn't start script analysis until you have a finalized script. Um, yeah. Because you don't want to be changing a bunch of stuff in the actual script when you thought it was finished, especially if you're going to copyright it and all of that, because then you have to re-copyright it. And so it's more costs and stuff like that. So if you are the writer and going to be the director in it, be sure to get people involved while you're writing it so you can hear an outside perspective, so you can change stuff in the script. Um, also when, when it's are... stuff, oh, sorry, honey. I was just gonna say also when it's stuff that you, uh, I feel like we want sometimes try to over explain too, where it's like, oh, I need to make this very clear. And then a third party could tell you like, hey, you made this really clear. It's a little too obvious, but too. Right, yeah. But yeah, so you want to do that while you're writing is get people involved so that you can change the script. Once you have a finalized script, after you've gone through several drafts um, and you feel like it's it's good to be finalized and you get that final feedback from your friends or your movie uh, fellow filmmakers, then you can you know lock your script in. And once you start getting ready to do pre-production and like the directing side of things, that's when you want to try to detach yourself and um, come at it as if you weren't the writer of the story and come at it as if it was any other script. So then you can find the possibilities that aren't there. Like I said, it's something as simple as coming home. How did they come home? Did they just come in a car? If so, that's fine. But that isn't the only possibility because people can have multiple modes of transportation to get home. And while it may not seem important, it does start to change who your character is. Why did they walk? Maybe they don't like driving. Why don't they like driving? Maybe something happened in their past. That's when all those questions start coming up that create a character that is unique, even though the story in the script itself, that character may seem like it's one note or it may seem like it's a cliche. But if you can come up with this backstory and this subtext to create a character um, in the background, in the script, it will show, and the actor will Sometimes act out something... the lines in a different way than they would if they were a different character. It's just how it is. Sometimes it's something as simple as just adding, like the beginning of the having the beginning of the scene um, uh, start with the person coming out of a car or walking forward to the building and the car behind them. Like that simple thing will show. Okay, they drove there. Like something yeah. that's now, not. Now I mean you're talking about shots versus script so it's, it's, it's versus what you just said versus actually writing it out um and detailing it in words well yeah but wouldn't you like there's a way to not like prepare the shot but you can write it depending on how much you, if you're an independent creator um how involved you are in the script process and in the shooting process aren't there scripts at least that I've read, I don't know if they're all like this or if this is wrong, but aren't there scripts where they're like, we show them arriving, like they arrive at the place and then they can choose to shoot it however they want, but you make if it clear. It, if it's important for a certain aspect to be in the film, then you write it a certain way mm. so that the filmmakers have to incorporate it into whatever it is otherwise when you write spec scripts like it's really up to the filmmaker to determine oh I mean if it's in there oh yeah they they're in the car they're whatever but that can change too they can go from a car a bus a train wherever the conversation um but if it's like important there's a there's a specific way you write it that kind of like forces um it to be that way mm. um, otherwise so what would you bigger. think would be a good example of um showing that how they arrived there without making it like super specific well, that's, that's what i'm saying like with script analysis it's not important unless you feel it's important um mm -hmm. it isn't important to actually show these things it's important to know you and the actors and the the... No, I know. I'm just saying, like, how do you think as, um, how would you think you would go about that? Like, I wouldn't practically show it. speaking. I wouldn't show it. 
it would just change who that character is. It shapes who they are based on what they chose to do to get home. It doesn't mean it needs to be in the actual film. So practically mean, speaking, would we be talking with the actors about it? That's what, what I'm trying to get at. Like, what would be the best way of going about that? Would it be like while you're in script analysis, um, but also while you're in table reads, for example? Yeah. Yeah, like, um, well, it depends on what kind of director you are. But, um, you know, if you're doing a script analysis of your script that you wrote, you are detaching yourself from the writing aspect. You're not trying to fill in extra details in the writing because as the director, if you were just buying someone else's script, you should have kind of had a discussion of what changes need to be done. And of course you can mm -hmm. still make changes later, but script changes, like actual changes in the script itself, you kind of want to talk with the writer about it usually to get them to make those changes before they give you the finalized script. And then when you get the finalized script, you usually wanna hope that all that stuff's going to work. And if it doesn't, that's when you start changing it. Um, but a lot of it does also go happen while in the table reads, correct? Cause I've heard a lot of stories like that where they'll go through like small little changes or small conversations about their characters and their motivations and um, their, um, and story, and story, like, um, gosh, I forgot the word now, um, nuances, not nuances, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, subtext. Subtext, thank you. Subtext and stuff like that. Right, well, and that's, just, but that's, but that's exactly what it is. It's subtext. It's not the actual text. Text is the stuff that you find in the script. Context is, is the stuff that's happening around it, like the action, the scene. The setting so it actually is found in the script as well but it's like why are they having this discussion and you go in the script and you see the context because before you know they in the other scene they said they had to go talk to them so now they're going and not talking to them that's the context subtext is the unspoken stuff the stuff that's not going to be in the actual script it's just the why it's the why are they talking to them what are they trying to get out of this and that stuff isn't shouldn't be illustrated in the actual script otherwise it feels exposition-y but you would work on that with the actors usually yeah you try to work on that with the actors with with table reads and rehearsals yeah i just After, wanted to make that... if you're the director you should i mean not always like i said it depends on the director but most directors from what i've seen and heard do a script analysis themselves because they need to know the story so they know they because actors are going to ask a lot of questions they're going to be like, why am, why am I saying this again? Or what, what's my motivation? How are you supposed to know the motivation without knowing the subtext and the background story that's not in the script? That's what the script analysis is for. It's finding that subtext, finding that background story. And that doesn't mean it has to be one thing. It can be multiple reasons. And also a director might be, well, why do you, why do you think that you're doing this? What, what do you think his motivation is or her motivation that, is. That's where I'd be curious to talk to actors and actually ask them, um, like, do you talk to, because I know sometimes they do depending on specific scenes, but you always see in like movies and TV shows about these things that they go for every little thing, like, hey, what's my character's motivation in this scene and blah, 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 and that scene. I wonder how much is actually the actor in his craft and working on it by himself and with the script and how much is him working with the director beforehand to try to I think it really it. depends on both a few different things. The director, if the director asked or requested them not to do a script analysis beforehand because they wanted to work on it with them, if whatever the process the director goes through to get their script analysis and whatever process the actor goes through to get their process, because they're it's all gonna be different depending on what actor. You yeah. might have one that's more technical. You might have one that's more spiritual and they're looking at it in different ways. And that's why they can all come to a different way of, of doing the character. Yeah, I just think it's interesting to think about like the process and all that kind of stuff. But sorry, mm -hmm. I didn't mean to go off track. I just like thinking about like, okay, how, what would practical uses of this be, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but like, uh, that's why it is hard like to be a writer director or the writer actor it is hard because you already have an idea of how it is and you're kind of doing a multiple processes with the, with the script and the story. 
and you're in multiple phases of the production when you normally wouldn't be in either of those roles. One of them, you might be there the whole time. The other role, you might only be there during a little bit of the pre-production and production. And then the other one, you're there for every phase or something like that. So you just, it's kind of hard to, it gets a little tricky. And that's why it, it, you need to be able to detach yourself from being the script writer. You need to write the script, but then when you're gonna be, okay, I'm gonna look at this from a, an acting or a directing standpoint or production designer standpoint or whatever you're doing with the script, um, you have to detach yourself from the, being the script writer so you can look at it with new eyes. So you can look at it with a new, fresh view. Also, I think, uh, yeah, there is something on the page and there is something off the page. So what's on the page is like relevant to the scene. Like for instance, if somebody's coming in a car and uh, you know, and maybe a mother is looking from the window outside in the car and that's part of the scene where uh, you know, it basically says, okay, you have a new car. So it's part of the conversation when they come inside or maybe she's making preparations to, you know, uh, to get something ready before they come inside the house. So that could be one which is on the page, right? but there's something which is off the page where it's uh, inherently in the scene saying that they have arrived, but there is a, mood set or a tone of scene which uh, needs to be established and uh, you know the script analysis is basically going to be saying okay what happened uh, you know where they're coming from they're coming in the bus they're coming in the train and then they took the car you know from the station that they parked and they came there in traffic so all this is kind of part of off the page but it's equally relevant to the scene because scene is now demanding their mood, their uh, behavior, their attitude as they come into the house. So yeah. the script analysis is basically going to be exploring those different uh, angles and areas uh, with, the, uh, with the actors, uh, but it's, it's part of the scene, but it's off the page. It's not really the page, but how much you want to bring that into the page is again, you know, comes about from uh, the script analysis, you want to have some conversations where you're basically saying the state of their mind or they're fighting once they come inside because the frame, uh, their mindset is completely uh, you know, spoiled by the traffic that they came through. So the stuff, which is subtext, right? I mean, I think that's what uh, uh, that was mentioned. I think that's also there. It really adds another layer to the actor's job as well, because he's not just giving the performance in that moment. He's also thinking of the performance as a whole. He's also thinking of the, um, the entire personality and the entire story and the entire backstory of his character while he's performing that one scene. Right. Also and that's why they should do that beforehand, at least with the director or on their own and then with the director. Uh, because they need to know that inside and out, kind of. Like, when they get to the scene, they should be ready to go, hopefully, when they're actually shooting it, because if they're trying to figure out all that stuff on the set, uh, they're going to bog down the scene, they're going to make it a little bit, or they're just going to be taking too long to, to get going. So that's why script analysis is so important, especially for actors, directors, production designers. Um, See, also there is a, that's also another thing, right? The subtext is usually very difficult to bring it to the scene. Uh, you know, there is like acting involved, there is direction involved, there is the whole atmosphere of mise en scene, you know, just whatever you have. So sometimes if that subtext is to be brought in, is not really brought in properly, or maybe have difficulty in bringing it in. So uh, you would probably change the script based on the script analysis saying that, okay, maybe, maybe we want to add some dialogues in here, which would reflect to the state of mind or uh, whatnot, right? So that could be a change that could be coming off of the script analysis on the page. And, uh, you know, thereby you're getting a direct, um, you know, your direct uh, uh, narration coming from that dialogue that the mm -hmm. audience is basically in tune with what's actually happening in that scene. So, so you're saying it can also be a collaborative effort, not just on the actors, but also on the 
um, lighting needs to give subtext right. as well, the words yes. themselves, yeah. Yeah, yeah, subtext and, is like a whole combination of uh, things, right? Which is, you know, like something which is not on the page or not in the scene itself. Right, something that's not stated, yeah. but it's just, it's there in the background. It's something that you, it's implied or you have to really think about it to get to it. Um, and sometimes it's not really like going to be changing the film itself. It's just so that you and your actors have a deeper understanding of what's going on. So they know how to do that scene. Um, certain things that you do will be a little confusing if you're not showing what it means. Like let's reverse it and say that they're having a conversation, they're having an argument, um, and they're getting ready to travel away. Where are they going? What kind of transportation are they taking? Because if they're taking a bus or something like that, that they have to actually get in time to be, like they have a time frame to actually get to the transportation that they need to go, then they are going to be a little bit more sped up, a little bit more rash. And like, I kind of, you know, I can't have this conversation right now compared to just needing to go to the car or going on a walk. And they're just going, oh, I can't have this right now. I don't feel like talking. Those are two kind of different things that will sure, that'll be a similar scene, but will be acted out differently depending on what the subtext is for where the transportation is. If they're acting like they really need a rush because maybe you say that they have to take a plane, that would be when, like Vish was saying, you might add in a line of dialogue. You'd be like, well, I, can't, I can't do this right now. I have to catch my plane. I have to catch my flight. And there you go. Now it explains why they're in such a rush. It is also interesting to think about, isn't it? Like when the subtext should just be um, with the line or that scene in particular, or when it should be the atmosphere, when it should be all around the scene and not just in the dialogue, like Fish said, and like you mentioned, it's not always super in the story, like around it, surrounding it. Sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's just in a line, or sometimes it's just in a particular moment. It's not every single aspect of the scene. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm explaining it right. I mean, yeah, like it, it, it might build the character. You might not need to know, like why do we need to know why he's or she's upset and wanting to get this done? It might just be a character thing that makes it feel like they just don't like arguing. Mm -hmm. But in reality, well, not in reality, but in the subtext that the director and the actor have agreed upon, really they're feeling like they need to hurry up and go catch their bus ride. So they're like, I don't have time for this, or I, I can't do this right now, and they leave. Those are two different things that'll make the acting a little bit different, but for the viewer themselves, it might just come across as something that character is, I mean, that's how the character is, and they don't or need like, to know the transportation. That's yeah. why it's subtext. It might not ever appear in the script. It might not ever appear in the film, but it will help to develop the character, why they're acting that way to the actor and director, and then it's up to the director to really see, like, is the audience going to be confused because does this make sense? It still makes sense either way. Like if they're just trying to rush out of the conversation, that can still make sense. Some people just don't like confrontation and arguments. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be stated. They have to go catch their bus ride. That could just be the subtext to make the actor get to that um, performance. So it can be something as subtle as that to like, we were talking about as collaborative effort the director wanting a subtext to be more um, stated or, or more a part of the atmosphere of the scene and ask to work with lighting or work with um, a, the, uh, the actor on a specific emotion, that a way that he says the line, that kind of thing to also add to the subtext. Of the scene. Yeah, like Vish was saying, with the subtext, the beforehand subtext, we're still talking about transportation just to keep it on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, if they take their car, they might not be as in a mood as if they took a rundown bus that had a lot of people and it was crowded and it was annoying and the bus took forever because it had a million stops. And so they've just taken a really long bus ride from wherever they came from. And so then that might affect the lighting, the color of the scene, because now that character's in a little bit worse of a mood than they would be if they were just driven there themselves. The way they look as well, like if they're disheveled or... Yeah, like if they're just like, if they're a little tired looking, if they look kind of grumpy just off the bat. And it's those little things in the background, that subtext from the script analysis change what is going on with the scene 
and change who the character is and make them unique, which is why which is why it's so important for a director mainly, as well as the actor, but mainly the director to know the overall subtext of the entire script, because they're going to be influencing those decisions whenever they're deciding on all of the different things from people doing the CGI, the lighting, the um, concept art, the props, the costumes. I mean, everything is going to be portrayed in a way that helps to, hopefully that helps develop what that scene was supposed to be and what that subtext is without specifically and explicitly stating it. So it goes without saying that it most likely should be something done in pre-production, figured out in pre-production before filming. Oh yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes you'll come to a scene where everybody agreed on something, the actors and the director thought something's gonna work and it's just not working. And that's when they have to like either go to the side and try to figure out a new way of going about it or figure out something on the spot. But usually you wanna try to have as much of that hashed out and figured out before you get to the actual scene and the set because it'll just make it flow so much easier and it'll make your film more cohesive as a whole because you had an idea of what the underlining meaning is. Script analysis, a lot of it too, is just about the characters. What are the characters going through? Why are they in this mood or why are they, you know, what emotion do they have and why? Um, and where are they trying to go with this? Everybody, anytime there's a conversation with anybody, they always are wanting something out of it. Um, even if it's just they want to talk to their friend, they want to have a friendly talk. You know, something could be as simple as that, or it could be they're trying to get them to admit to this thing that they did in the past and blah, 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 blah. And all these little different things of how and why they're going about different conversations and different motivations and actions will help develop the character and the script as a whole. And the characters, which we'll talk about later on when we're talking about script analysis, they have their objectives within each scene. And they also have what is called a super objective or a life objective. And that's like their main goal in life, even if it's unknown to them. They might not know what their main life goal is, but everything they do kind of shows that that's what they're going for, even if they don't really get it themselves. Or they might know exactly what they want and know what their life goal is. But in each individual scene, in each individual moment, they're still going to have different objectives within each scene, depending on who they're talking to, where they're at, what they're doing. Um, and we'll get into all of that a lot later, but it's a very in-depth look. Script analysis is just a very in-depth look at the script to figure out all of that information that isn't specifically there, but also keeping in mind all of the information that is there so that you can expand on what is given in the script. And it's a lot of stuff that's in the script and a lot of stuff that's not in the script that you have to figure out to get the characters to be their own person and give them reasons for doing the things that they're doing in the script so that the actors and the director have an easier time explaining it um, with each other and, and going through those emotions and figuring out, does this even make sense on a story point why they're going from point A to point B? And most of the time it can, if you just look at it deep enough. So also what I'd like to add is sometimes like uh, the writer would uh, have the subtext in there and uh, you know, the writer, the writer is basically written and long gone, right? And the script lands up on uh, in the hands of the director and the director is basically going to this. Does he see that subtext? That's also another thing. So the script analysis will, will basically bring up that subtext, which is uh, of, you know, which is hidden under the dialogues and the narration that's on, mm -hmm. on the page. And also, uh, does he introduce some subtext on his own, uh, which is besides what it's already there on the page? Uh, so at the end of the day, it's essentially the audience, which is going to see and say, okay, I see where this thing is going, where he is going with so and so character or where the so and so person is uh, heading to or where the scene is heading to. So there's like a combination of different things happening. And that's what is coming out of um, sleep analysis. You're trying to project the final image of final you know, scene outcome. 
which uh, you all are almost doing. Mm -hmm. the judge can yeah, and so it helps whenever the actor knows all of their 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 character in depth because you know films and TV shows are not filmed in order most of the time. They're broken up and filmed by location or by availability of the actors and the crew and whoever's needed for that scene to be done. So the actor needs to know their character and what they're going through because they're going to be in a different state of mind with each scene. Each scene that they do, they're not going from point A to point B. They're maybe going from point C to point A to point B to point D to point A again to point E. And just keep going back and forth because the script's broken up in a way that is best for the finances of the actual film and for, um, you know, again, availability, logistically, the reason. So it's not shot in order. So the actor really needs to know, like, that's why, like, wait, what's my motivation again? And that's why the director can explain, remember in the last scene, you had this fight with your mom. So right now you are not in good terms with her. And so now this scene is happening. This is three months later. And because the script jumps in time three months, then you figure out like, okay, what do we think happened in between? What do you think? Do you think she, I don't, I don't think they've talked to each other since then because in this scene, they're still kind of arguing, blah, 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 blah. So you figure out all that stuff so that the actor can really have a deeper understanding of, of what mood to be in and what, what their character's going through in that moment. So that each scene, even though it's broken up in weird, in weird ways, that wouldn't be real to real life. Um, they can still keep a level head of, of what they're going through and, and maintain that emotion throughout. But yeah, we'll get in more into script analysis later on in the semester. We'll talk about more things and what to look for and how to go through it. I think the next thing we're talking about is given circumstances, which is basically the stuff stated in the script or implied to in the script of um, what circumstances the characters are under. I'm gonna talk about that more later, but when you're doing it, just remember to be, to listen, be open-minded to others, suggestions and interpretations too, like your actors and production designer, because they all have a different interpretation of it, a different reasoning for something. And it might work better than what you originally had in mind if you were the director. Um, and if you're the actor, just be prepared to not, like, the same thing, be open-minded and be, once you figure it out with the director, what the reasoning is, that's when you can lock it in. But before that, try to be open-minded and not have a set way with your character. But if you truly have a deep understanding of this character and you feel like the director isn't going the way that you feel like it should, you can always speak up and try to convince them of that choice that you think they should be, they're making. Um, you can, you can try to like discuss that with them. And then the production designer, if you are that, or if you have one, they will usually try to um, maybe not, like, they'll try to like figure out the characters as best they can because everything in production design is revolving around the character and the scene and the emotion that's supposed to be displayed. So they'll be having deep discussions with the directors about what the character's going through. Um, and they might also have their own interpretation of it, which they will give you and the director can then decide if they want to go with that or not. So just be open-minded and, and don't lock down the one thing until you have a collaborative effort, I would say. Yeah, Brian? Does anybody else have anything to add, by the way? Uh, I, I was going to say, um, you guys mentioned earlier about getting a third party to read the script um, to get some insight. Um, First, you know, it's it's hard to get people to read your script. That's one. Um, but another thing, depending on who that person is, so you were saying get somebody you trust, um, which you would think like that's the best route, but normally people that like you trust that are your friends or somebody close to you aren't really going to give you um, honest feedback. You know, they, they're going to tell you things you like to hear. Um, you don't have a blunt friend? I do. I, I'm, I'm usually, <laughs> it tells you how it is. Me, myself, I'm usually the blunt friend. I'm used to being the blunt friend. <laughs> I have a blunt husband. <laughs> a lot of times, specifically when we're talking about scripts and stuff, um, 
not not to say what you guys are saying. You would think that that would be like a good idea, and it is. But that also can lead into a lot of drama as well, because a lot of people are so um, attached to the script that it's like, oh, you can't tell me otherwise. Mm-hmm. So, which leads to another point where you like you have to humble yourself to a point where it's like you you have to be open because if you have this person that read your script and is asking all these questions, you have to look at it as as one big science project, you know, oh, he read the script and he has all these questions, that could be a problem. You know, why should he have, you know, um, you as Instead a- Instead of like, he's pro- he probably just doesn't get it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, as opposed to like, maybe there is a problem. As opposed to, well, you just don't understand. Well, that know. says more, I don't know. I guess I've just dealt with enough of that. I have a lot of blunt people in my life, my mother, a lot of my friends. Um, so it's just one of those things where I'm like, if I am asking for someone's feedback, honest feedback, and they are at a point where they are afraid to give it to me, or they are tr- like, or I, they try to give it to me and I get defensive, that says more about me than it does about the person. Well, I feel like that's why I said you gotta you gotta humble yourself. You have to be yeah. able. To- listen to that when i hear feedback especially on my my youtube i get like a mixed reaction from people like one of my films the guy was like oh the acting sucks but the script is great and i was like thank you but fuck you at this (laughs) because i wrote it and then i also directed it so it's like it was kind of like a diss but then at the Uh... same time Yeah, <laughs> it is hard because, of course, it's also hard because some people will get it and some there will be people that just don't get it. That is a reality, too. But it is and it is hard because self-awareness is not a, a, like a very easy human trait to to master. Um, I feel like even the, the most self-aware of people, it's hard. So um, it is I feel like. There, you, that's why I say like find someone who you think likes similar stuff that you do has like because that way if they also don't like it or even your target audience maybe not someone that likes the same stuff as you do someone that likes different stuff than you do but you know their taste is good and you know that maybe they like different things than you but they have but they still you know understand a good script and you trust their opinion and it is hard. It can be really hard. Not everyone has that person in their life. Ideally, it would be great if everyone had that one blunt friend who told you like it is and hurt your feelings every now and then. Um, <laughs> but I mean, best case scenario is what I meant is if you can find that person. And if you can't, you can always, like we always talk about, um, if you, you probably, if you're in that process of pre production, you have the um you have the rights to it already like you already purchased the um the copyright and all this stuff if you're in that process um if you're in the process of you know it's a not even pre-production but like you have that script and you want to use it um so assuming you already should have it maybe there are places and websites and forums where you can like share your script and they can give feedback or you can ask a group of students like a fa- like Facebook group, stuff like that. Like, hey, I have the copyright for this so no one can steal it, but like, I would like feedback. Would that be a possibility maybe? They have, they have feedback festivals. You can submit scripts to get feedbacks from other writers and other you know, just people outside. And like I said, like I look at it as one big science project. So like my thing is like, if if people aren't really clicking or getting it, or if they have so many questions or different kind of questions, then I use it as, well, maybe I need to look into it because once you film it, it could be a problem later on um, that maybe you just don't see, or maybe you just don't really, uh, you know, pay attention to. I mean, every, even the, the most, like I'm watching Terminator 2 and I haven't seen Terminator 2 in a couple of years, but I'm watching it now. And like, there are things that I never, ever seen. I've seen it a hundred times that I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, I never paid any attention to that. But, you know, the, the question is like, didn't they, didn't they, did they have, a, did they ever have a conversation about that when they wrote the script? Or, you know what I'm saying? Did anyone sit them down and think like, hey, like, you know, there's a plot hole here. That, oh, probably. 
<laughs> you know, these big budget movies has like hundreds of people. It's them. hard because there's so much to focus on and there's so much of the story that of course bound, things are bound to like slip through the cracks when it's that big of a production and that big of it. And you don't, you don't want to spend millions of dollars on a movie that has that loophole in it to, to screen it and then the audience and your, your reviews are, you know, you're getting all, all these critics that are bringing that up you know, as a, as a big issue. Um, so it's good to get this out the way while it's still in the script phase. That's the, yeah. yeah. Um, and but I also it- feel like there's no such thing as a perfect script, if we're being completely honest. There will always be one little nitpick, one little flaw that people will be able to find. That's not saying that you shouldn't try to make it as foolproof as, and perfect as possible. And there's always room for improvement. But at the end of the day, you also have to... Um, find the right balance between okay let me try to foolproof this as much as possible and there will be things that slip through the crack and as long as I make my movie good good enough to where those plot those like little tiny minute details that I might miss don't matter because it's just that good I, I constantly reference back to the future for this it has a huge plot hole like a huge plot hole that I'm like how the heck did no one think of that it's one of my favorite movies of all time and it's almost it's practically perfect to me in many ways well yeah there's that and then if you find yourself constantly having to explain something um chances are that there there might be an issue yeah that is a really good thing also if you find that oh you understand it but people are asking questions Sometimes, yeah, people just, you know, they don't think like you do, or maybe like it's for a specific type of people. Like, uh, what's that director that made Inception? I always forget his name. Christopher Nolan. Christopher Nolan. No, thank you. Christopher Nolan, his movies are for people that are willing to analyze and think. And I know a lot of people that hate Inception because they think it's too conv- convoluted or too complex, or you have to pay so much attention to it. Yet I love that, that it has like so many little details and it's almost foolproof. Um, so it also depends on your audience and you have to think about that as well, but you also have to think about, am I like, who is this movie for at the end of the day? Who am I writing it for? What is the audience I want to get? If I want to make a Christopher Nolan type of film, I need to know that I'm going to get a Christopher Nolan type audience that likes to analyze film, that likes to look at everything, that will pay attention 100%. If you want a broader audience or if you want a different audience or to have as many people as possible, you need to change that. It can't be that complex. So you I'm gonna jump in. To- <laughs> All right, I'm gonna be blunt with it. Um, we're probably yeah, not the best writers. A lot of writers think they are, but they're not. And so I completely agree with what Brian's saying. I agree with what Priscilla's saying too, but the problem with that, with looking at it, like they don't get it because I just have a really complex script is that you think that your script is so good that it's not being understood by people. When in reality, the more likely scenario, which isn't always the case, but the more likely scenario, especially as an independent filmmaker and a script writer who, you know, maybe you've never made even a, one film. Well, if, if people aren't understanding what you're trying to go for, it's probably a problem in the script because it's probably not correctly conveying what you think it's going for. Because as the script writer, you can see, you know all the subtext, you know the background stuff, you know why this character is acting this way. But as a new viewer, as a new person who's never does anything in your mind, they might be like, what, what? This, the one, one scene he was acting this way and the next scene he's completely different. What changed, what happened? And in your head, when you were writing the script, you thought he went through this and thought this and thought that, but you don't have it in the script or you don't have something in the script that kind of conveys how he went from point A to point B. So maybe you need to add in a new scene or maybe you need to change the way he's acting or maybe you need to take out something because if, if everybody you're going to is not getting it. The it, majority of people. Even. The majority of people is not getting that conclusion that you think is there. And it's usually a problem with the script. I was going to say that, but I was trying to be nice. Perfectly great script. And even executives of films that buy movies, 
they don't get it sometimes. Writers will say that a lot. You know, they just don't get it. Like I have it. They take the notes, but that's why you take notes and you look at them and you, you see if it makes sense. really see, is there a problem here? Or is it just that they didn't understand what the script was? Because those are two different things. And, and executives the do think the that the, ma- the majority of people are stupid. It's not in the script. The majority of the reason why will be you didn't write it as well as you thought. And it's not in the actual script or it's, it's not executed the way you thought it would be like it's not the perfect way to get about to that part of the script that is confusing it. and then you have the opposite extreme where most pro- producers and like big company execs treat their audience like they're stupid and they make you do like a million little things to over explain as well which is also frustrating I was again, trying that's to... that's some most of the time that could most be... of the time that's not the case yeah no no getting... most of the time most of the time it's it's that the executives think these are the reasons and in reality there's something else missing why does the executive think i need to over explain this clearly it's probably not obvious enough but that doesn't mean i have to do every single thing that they said it just means i have to change it enough change something about it to get it to be understood by them. We went over this a lot when we were talking about yeah. script writing in the first semester, but um, you have to humble, like Brian's saying, you have to humble yourself and not think that you're the best script writer in the world and your script is perfect and there's no problems with it and everyone who doesn't get it is an idiot or they just didn't understand your brilliance. Because typically the majority of your script, of uh, the reason why people won't get it if you are giving it to a bunch of people and they're all saying the same thing, especially if they're saying the same thing, and it's something in your script that needs to be changed or added or taken out to make it make sense or to make whatever they're saying change. Yeah, uh, that's basically where I was getting at. I was trying to get to the point, I'm glad I have you because sometimes I will try to like over explain so I don't sound like I'm being a B. Um, like, oh, you're just not that, like, I'm, but, yeah, that's basically where I was getting at because it's, oh yeah, there are cases. Basically the point that I was trying to make is what you're saying is where, who do you want the audience to be in the sense of if you want to get as many people as possible, you need to think about, oh, this person isn't getting it. Let me analyze my script. Let me see which arguments might be founded and which ones maybe, you know, are not. And it is a hard balance. I feel like it can be because when we're, new creators, we already second guess ourselves a lot. And there will be people- Not all of them. <laughs> that's true, that's true. There are some people who think they're the best thing since sliced bread um, and they're like God's gift to the world. But I'm just saying that for me, speaking for me personally, I am, am a person that second guesses myself a lot. So it is very hard for me um, to look at my work in anything and think, okay, what is, I need to improve, and what are nitpickings, Um, and what is, you know, more often than not, that's not the case, more often than not, it's, I need to adapt, but I feel like it's a hard balance to find as a creator, because it's good to be confident in your work, and um, know that, like, this is a story worth telling, but also find the balance between, okay, but I need to be able to listen to feedback. I need to be able to um, give this to the world and make changes that are necessary because this story isn't just for me. This story is for the people that I want to see, that I, for as many people as possible to be able to see. And I feel like when you look at it through that, it might help. You know, there, there's some kind of, there's, there's some key things that pop up when I discuss other people's work um, and I'll ask questions a lot and a lot of people don't really pick up on it, but I ask certain questions and I'll listen and determining on what they answer kind of determines on, you know, whether I go into it anymore or do I just leave it alone? Because a lot of things, something I picked up on is like, I ask, oh, why did you do that? Either script or film. Why did you? have that in there um and i'll notice a lot of people use or say this i was trying to establish this that and the other keywords established um when you're using words like oh i was trying to establish chances are that you went off course some kind of way to 
try to establish whatever. Oh, I wanted to establish a relationship between these two characters. Well, chances You're saying are, because it should already be in subtext. I hear the word established a lot. And that's the key for me when I listen to people and explaining and when they say established, chances are a lot of times, like a good eight, maybe seven, eight out of 10 times, chances are it's over a scene that doesn't really need to be there. If you find yourself using the word established a lot, chances are you might want to look into like either taking it out, re revising it or doing something with it or finding whatever words because you might have something that is deviating from the actual story, which means people can lose interest, it could get boring or it can just piss a lot of people off because it doesn't need to be there. So like that's, these are the things I look for when I discuss and critique and stuff. I'll say, why did you do that? Oh, I was just trying to establish this, that, and the other. And I, I noticed like people say that a lot. I was trying to establish versus whatever it is that they were trying to establish is already there in the contents of whatever it is that they're writing um, while staying on the main subject and the main you know topic. Like, a, like I'm watching, like I just said, I'm watching Terminator now and just watching it, they stay on point throughout the script. There was really no point in the script they, where they deviated to say, with the exception of the deleted scenes. Those were the scenes where it's like, oh, I was trying to establish some kind of something. And when you and, watch them, you can clearly see why they're deleted. Yeah, exactly. So like, if you, you got to pay attention to that. If you find that you're saying the words, I'm trying to establish anything uh, too much, then you could kind of like police yourself a little bit and say, oh, well, okay. Like, I don't need to go, like, all right, I get it. Like, or ask yourself, <laughs> why do I feel the need to try to establish this? Why is it not already in the subtext or in the context of the story? Why is it, why do I need to add this? I feel like that's yeah. also a good way. I feel like I know that I'm that nerd that likes watching the commentary, but like, I feel like it might really help writers to actually go through the deleted scenes. I don't know if DVDs still do this, but you know how those old movies would have like in the DVD, they would have the deleted scenes and the director or the, or the writer would, or both, would go through them and explain like, this is why we cut this scene out. Yeah, um, and I, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, they still do that. They still do that. They still yeah. I feel like that's really good for a new uh, a, a writer that's like learning to go through and to listen to, because I feel like that helps us understand, okay, so this is why they deleted that scene. Um, and watching it, I can tell like, yeah, this doesn't add anything, or maybe this does add, but it's an unnecessary add, or like, it, it just helps us understand their mind better and therefore have that mentality when going into our writing or our directing. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times they'll cut stuff out for time's sake. Um, then a lot of times they'll just say, "Well, it just doesn't it doesn't need to be there." So I guess they, they kind of do like an analysis after their own analysis after it's all said and done. Says it doesn't need to be there. Um, like with Terminator, for example, <laughs> the deleted scene with Sarah Connor at the end of the movie, where it's the future without Judgment Day and everything is in the future. I'm so glad they deleted it because it doesn't do anything it's just the big waste of film um and then i think cam i think yeah cameron said that was like it's there we filmed it but he was like i i really don't feel that we needed to see you know the future you know well that the, that future he was like we didn't we didn't need to see it so we took we took it out um so yeah like it's just you know being subconscious of uh question you know when you get questions you know you want to be able to pay attention to them and pay attention to what these questions are being asked and what your answers to those questions may be like I'm answering this question but is my answer um actually like am I you know in my opinion you know there shouldn't be any questions in my opinion like you should have that many I mean of course people are going to have questions but um a lot of films, specifically sci-fi films, Star Wars, Ghostbusters, Jurassic Park, a lot of those questions are just, you know, fan... About the world. Fan fantasy about 
oh, I believe this character did that because of that and this and the other. Um, and then you'll have fans like argue back and forth about why that character did something or why this character did that. And right. it's a big question mark as to the, the director's intent as to why. But I would also go as far to say that if you find yourself having to over explain or justify a scene, too much, then yeah, you sh you sh you're not doing that good of a job of writing it. Because if people are asking you a question and you immediately find yourself having to over explain it or having to justify why it's there, um, or having to be like, because of this, duh, then it's not as obvious as you thought. It's not as necessary as you thought. Exactly, like you shouldn't have to explain your film. That's what the film was supposed to do, explain itself. You know, there shouldn't, you know, it defeats the purpose of making the movie if you constantly have to answer questions for it. You, you get what I'm saying? So, yeah. Gabe said, what about two endings? You mean like deciding which ending to go with? Or you mean like an have... alternate ending, right? No, it would just be like a bonus. I mean, yeah, no, 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 exactly. I call that the alternate ending. Now, what yeah, so that'd be like if you have two endings in mind and you're not really, you do decide to go with one, but you're like, here was the other thing we were thinking. It's pretty okay. much like, what I see that as. Like, oh. Here's what we were thinking could have happened, but we decided not to because we thought this one made more sense. Or sometimes studio interference. Like the butterfly effect for me is one of the best director's cuts, alternate endings. Um, the original, not the horrible remakes, sequels. Um, now, but does the original. It to, now, does it have to do like, you know, like if, if, if they have like, a big fan base? You know, and you know, usually like the fans like may have like different views and they, they put it out there. Um, you know, to get the, the, the fans reaction. So because that's how I that's why I thought they would do the, the two different endings. No, they usually don't they usually don't, they usually don't show the endings to I mean they oh. might use both the endings in like test screenings, but they don't like send it out to people because they want them to come oh. see the, the film and see the ending. For themselves. Unless they release a special edition with the alternate endings and the director's cut be for either because the studio allowed them or because it's a special edition or because they had a completely different vision for it. Um, like I mentioned with the butterfly effect, the audiences, they actually had, if I'm not mistaken, they actually had that ending and they thought it was too depressing. Um, and they wanted a more hopeful ending. So um, he actually, in the DVD, I showed Coda, there were two hopeful endings, like two good endings, one like great ending, one good ending. And then the director's cut, which was the alternate ending, which I'm not gonna spoil it if you ever wanna see it, but it's, it's basically very depressing. It's very depressing. And um, so that didn't do well with audiences, but a lot of people still liked it and when the director was talking about it, people were like, oh, I want to see it, I want to see it. So the studio released the DVD with the alternate ending and it completely changes. I wouldn't say, would you say, honey, it completely changes the moral of this story? Mm, I don't know, I don't think so, but it does definitely change how you think about it. I think the story overall has a different meaning to me watching that ending. All right, either way, I'm going to wrap this up by saying um, script analysis <laughs> is really important to figure out all that subtext. The reason why people ask questions sometimes, like Brian was saying with the fans asking questions about why a character Ooh, did something honey, or why they chose can I say to do one, something. Honey? Uh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say one more thing. With the Lord of the Rings one, I was going to ask you a question because you know more about them than me. Um, the extra endings, was that for DVD? What? Lord of the Rings doesn't have extra endings? The, like, super long cut. The extended cut. That was for DVD, correct? That was for time, yeah. And so the, the four bajillion endings, they were in the original cinematic cut, right? Yep. Okay, yeah, I was just wondering about that. Yeah, he wanted to wrap everything up, so he made sure to show everything ending so that there were no left open, unanswered questions for the most part. I feel like one of those endings could have been cut for the scene that was super important with Saruman, but that's just me. <laughs> that wasn't the same movie. I, I know, but I'm saying that, like, if when you're looking at time, but all that of wasn't them the were same extended. movie. That but the Saruman scene was the second movie. All of but... them were extended, though. All of them were extended cuts. 
we have all the extended cuts. All of them had crucial scenes, in my opinion, that needed to be there. Well, yeah, but there was also, you know, it was already three hour long movies, so he didn't want to make four hour long movies for the, for the theaters. The theaters don't want long movies like that as much either because they want to have more showing to get more money. So there's a lot of uh, different reasons why they want to have movies shorter. It's for attention spans for people. It's not like a play where you go and have an intermission break in between. You just have to sit through the whole thing. So people have to get up to go to the bathroom. They're missing part of the movie or they're sleeping through it. And they just don't feel like it's harder for people to set aside that much time. There's, you know, so there's a bunch of different yeah. reasons why um, the studios don't want it to be that long and why the theaters don't want it to be that long. Movie theaters showing older movies are actually doing that now, like having intermissions and stuff. But yeah, I just wanted to ask because I didn't remember and I was thinking about. All right. Well, anyway, so script analysis, it's very important to figure out the subtext because like Brian was saying with the, the fans, um, when they're talking about, they have different reasons, they argue about the different reasons why a character did something. It's obviously, it's not in the actual script. It's not in the actual film itself because otherwise there'd be no argument there. They'd be like, well, this is in the script or this is what the film says. So that's what it is. And that's what the, the subtext is. The script analysis that was done, the filmmakers decided to, the filmmakers and the actors decided to go with one, one reasoning for their choices, the character choices. Um, but it's not told to the audience. It still develops the character, but it doesn't explicitly state why the character might have done that. It makes sense in the story, but there's still different reasons why they might come to that conclusion, which is what script analysis is. It's finding those different reasons and deciding on one of them to develop the performance of the actor and what the character's doing and why. Um, when you are the script writer and the director or the script writer, the actor, um, it, it does get convoluted, it does get a little harder, but you have to try to detach yourself from the script. Asking for feedback and stuff like that should be happening while you're doing the script writing, um, not after you're done. When you're doing script analysis, you will be finished, you should be finished with your script. And when you bring it to the actors, if you're the director and, you're, and, you, and you wrote the script and you're bringing it to the actors, they are also going to have their own interpretation of things. They're going to be asking why their characters are doing something. And if something doesn't make sense in the script, they will also be bringing it up. Well, this doesn't make sense because my character just had a fight with my mom, but now in this scene, we're talking like we're best friends. What happened? You know, and that's where Ryan was talking about. Brian was talking about hopefully those little things that were missed would be ironed out. The little tiny details, right? And then you can add a little line of dialogue. Well, that was Dish saying that, I think, with the line of dialogue. Oh, yeah, stuff. but Brian was also saying it as far as like watching the movie and seeing all this stuff and being like, How did they miss this detail? And that, oh, yeah. And that's where you can have, you know, that and then your production designer will also be asking questions and having a deep conversation with you as the director of why are we making this choice? Why are we choosing this color? And it's because the character is feeling this way or whatever. And then if the actor feels different way, it starts a whole conversation and it should help you iron out your script even further. But when we're talking about script analysis later in the semester, we're talking about it more from the standpoint of I mean, it could be either you being the script writer or not, but the script writer, we've talked about like writing a lot in the first semester and stuff like that. And we'll talk a little bit more about it with log lines and synopsis and stuff like that this semester, because that goes into marketing. So everything's kind of coming full circle, but uh, we're not gonna pay as much attention to it as if you were the script writer, because that adds in so much different information that needs to be known that we've kind of already gone over before. So we'll be looking at it more from just script analysis standpoint. You're already finished with the script, whether you wrote it or not, you are going to do a script analysis on this, whether you're an actor, a director, or a production designer, or somebody else doing it. Um, and we'll talk about it from that standpoint. I think that was all I was gonna say, but I do agree with, both Priscilla and Brian and what Vish was saying earlier too is like all of these things 
you need to be able to be humble. If you're doing a script analysis, you need to be able to be humble enough to accept other ideas of what this means, of what the choices have been to make the character feel this way in this scene and what are they feeling and why. Um, and then when you're a script writer, of course, you also need to be open to feedback. And like Brian was saying, it can start a drama, but if you are the script writer, you need to be able to receive that feedback, like he was saying, and, and realize that, okay, is something wrong with my script? Three people have asked me why they are best friends now when in the last scene they were fighting. Maybe I need to add something in between or add a line of dialogue or two to make it make sense. Or maybe I need to change the way they're acting to each other in the scene. And that's the actual script itself. But then when you're getting into script analysis, you also need to be open to, okay, the actor's asking me why they are best friends now and I don't have that in the script. Should we add something in or should we just make a choice? Does it still make sense to the story? And so there are different steps, but all of them you should be open to feedback and open to communication and collaboration because that's what films are about. All right. Moving on from that, we're gonna be talking about the film hook or the USP. So this is coming from filmmaking stuff. It's letter D in the syllabus uh, underneath film hook and USP. A USP is a unique selling proposition or also known as a unique selling point. In business, the USP is the distinction that makes people buy one product over another. Why do I care about buying these Nike shoes compared to buying these Adidas? What's the difference? What's the unique, the main unique selling point from one shoe to another? Why am I gonna buy one? Why am I gonna pay more or the same amount for this brand compared to this brand? For a film, your USP is your film's hook. What makes this story different? What makes this story unique? It's characters in the woods or in a cabin in the woods. It's a horror of a cabin in the woods that's been done before, but what sets this one apart? What makes this one different? The film hook separates you from the rest. Your film may be the horror movie set in the cabin, but what makes it unique? What's special about it? That's your hook. That's how it differentiates itself. Maybe it's the characters. Maybe it's how one of the characters is. Maybe one of the characters is blind. Maybe one of the characters is just really goofy. Maybe it's just like, it's not about the characters, it's more about the cabin and where they are or what's happening outside of the cabin. Something needs to be different for it to be a new and unique story. It can't just be a run of the mill, cabin in the woods, same as every other movie. Every movie that's made that has a cabin in the woods has been made because they have something unique about them. So they are a different film. Um, to find your movie hook, you take your broad, movie concept and distill it down to the bare yet memorable essentials. Then you incorporate some flavorful elements to make it stand out. So they give it a, they give it a uh, example of a boxer fights for the title. And then instead of using that, they make it an impoverished boxer is given a once in a lifetime chance to fight for the world heavyweight title which, uh, what's that movie called? That's, um, what is it called? What? An impoverished boxer is given a once in a lifetime chance to fight Rocky? for the world. Yeah, Hot Rocky. Hot Rocky, no, it's just Rocky. I said, yeah, Rocky. Oh, hey. I mean, yeah, huh. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so that's Rocky. So instead of it just saying a boxer fights for the title, which is what the movie is about, you know, it's a little bit more um, flavorful in the way that you, you explain it so that it hooks interest from a viewer. He's an impoverished boxer. He's given a once in a lifetime chance and he's fighting for a certain title, the heavyweight title, world heavyweight. And so, you know, that's more interesting than just a boxer's given fights for the title. A movie hook is similar to figuring out your log line, which we discussed in the first semester and will be discussed later in this semester because that goes with pitching and marketing. Log lines are very important. It goes for screenwriting to know what you're writing about, what your story is. And then it goes again when you're talking about marketing and 
when you're talking about um, what was I saying? When you're talking about marketing and pitching, that's what I was going to say. So when you're pitching it to investors, when you're pitching it to executives, when you're pitching it to distributors, when you're done with the film, you're using that to get their first um, glance, to get that first glance, to get that first interest in your film so that they come and ask more and, and want to buy it or want to invest in it or want to do something with it. When you do it for yourself in screenwriting, you're just doing it so you know what your story is, you know what the underlining theme and meaning of your story is and why it's being written, what sets it apart and what makes it different. And then when you're trying to get funding for it, you are showing them why it's different, showing them what the difference is. When you're marketing it, you're trying to get people to come see it. And so you're showing them why this movie is special. This stuff comes from scriptmag.com. It's letter B in the syllabus. When writing, the hook needs to be known and included in the structure before the script is written. This is their opinion. Some people don't write the logline before, but they recommend writing it before because hooks are very hard to tack on later when the screenplay is done. Your hook is integrated into the story and what makes your story different from all stories similar to it. And so they believe you should know it before you even write it out. You should know why your film is different. I would say it doesn't necessarily need to be written out beforehand, but you definitely have to have it in your mind of why this why are you even trying to do a cabin in the woods story if you're making it exactly like the 17 others that you've seen what makes you a special and different what would make somebody like you come and see that movie when you've already seen something very similar to it and then you can start thinking about all the differences and what makes your story unique this stuff comes from heart from the heart productions it's letter c in the syllabus oh never mind it's letter e in the syllabus um they state the USP or the unique selling point of your film is basically your log line. So they agree with the other source, filmmaker stuff. Simply, elegantly, and quickly conveying what will compel your target audience to pay to see the film or the show. You want to really quick, like uh, I think Gabe was talking about it earlier before we started recording. He was talking about how he's making the log line for his film. And you want it to be one to two sentences, usually one, because you want to hook somebody really quickly. There's so much stuff to watch out there. Why this? Why should I watch this instead? And so that first very brief description of the film needs to be very captivating. And uh, your selling point, this is, this is what's going to get you to sell your film to distributors. This is what's going to get your market, your target audience to pay to see your film or go log into wherever you're you're posting it to watch it if you're just trying to get views this thing is going to be the thing that makes people want to see it they say to use the five w's to help find your hook and usp who what when where and why who is the story about and who stands in their way what happens to him or her what is their goal? What are the obstacles and what are the stakes? When and where is the story set? Why would we care? Why is that the theme? Why would the protagonist put themselves through that? For pitching your USPs, um, you can also be the director, producer, writer, or actors if they are big names. So your unique selling point might be this film has Matt Damon in it. Matt Damon's a big actor and people like him. He has his fans. So we're going to just use his name to sell the movie. And that happens a lot with big names and big actors because there are large audiences of fans that are dedicated to certain people and will go see it no matter what it is. Um, just like if whoever makes it. If you're a fan of Christopher Nolan's films, you're likely going to see his next film regardless of what it's about because you like the way he directs or writes movies. So sometimes the USP, the unique selling point, will be the big name director, actor, producer, writers. Or it could be unique content not covered before or covered in that way from that perspective or something like that. 
you're going to make a World War II film, you might make it instead about soldiers, you might make a film that's about a family that's in a town that's getting, that's under the attack. I'm pretty sure that probably already exists, but if it doesn't, that would be a unique perspective on the same story. Um, because, you know, we've seen it from the, the side of the soldiers, we've seen it from the opposite side, we've seen it from the war side, but what about the common everyday man? What were they doing during that? What if their town was attacked? What if it wasn't attacked? You know, those are different perspectives in that same era, in that same story. And that can make your content unique if there's nothing else like it. The USB can also be two radically different stories coming together. Like our film is Saw meets The Notebook. And it's like, well, what does that mean? How is that, how does that go? And that's usually a unique selling point you do when you're trying to get investors or you're trying to sell it to executives and distributors. Um, when you're trying to like blend two, two films together like that, because you're giving them an idea of two things that have been done before. It's similar to these things, but if they were the same movie, and then it makes you think, well, how would that work? What would that look like? and maybe get interest from people who have seen those films. And maybe they're not even interested in the actual film itself. They're just kind of interested in seeing like, how would that even be? What would that look like? And so then when you show it to them, they might be more interested and they have a, a bigger chance of, of inviting you in to show them and pitch it to them in person. But you always wanna be thinking about your USPs with writing, um, you want to write your story uniquely. With pitching, it's to get investors or distributors, sales agents, producer reps, markets and festivals interested in the film. With marketing, it's to gain the attention and interest of your audience, your target market, or your target audience. And when creating a trailer, it's important to take into consideration the target audience as well as including the film's USPs in the trailer. We're gonna go deeper into trailers later this semester and target markets, but um, with the unique selling points, if your unique selling point is that you have Matt Damon, clearly you wanna put that in your trailer. You've seen this with films, I'm sure, and I have too, where the trailer has an actor that is barely in the movie, but they're a big enough name that it's going to draw in some audiences. They're a side character, or their character's in there for a few minutes but they put them in the trailer just to show like, look, this person's in it. And because that's gonna, that's one of their unique selling points. Or if points. they're like one of the exec, one of the producers, like one of the really tiny, like just, oh, this person, what was that film that said that it had Peter Jackson? Oh, what was that sound? That was like that, the City on so Wheels bad. film. It was the one with like, crap, I forgot the name. Mortal Engine? Mortal Engines, yeah. yeah. They put Peter Jackson's name all over it, and he was, apparently he wasn't very involved in it. But they put his name on there because he was a big name with, like, Lord of the Rings and other stuff, so they thought, hey, this is kind of fantasy sci-fi, so we're going to put his name in it to draw in that audience that likes his fantasy movies. Um, so I would say a, you know, a unique selling point is used to draw in investors, distributors, and to market it, because it can be in many different things. Whereas the film hook, I would say the film hook is the main story element, the main reason this story exists, where you the unique sell, that might be one of the unique selling points of the film is this is unique because of this reason. But I would say the film hook is the story, what drives it, what, why it's there in the first place. And the unique selling points are all the other stuff that can be used to market it and used to sell it. Like the actors are in it, the director, this producer was part of it. This executive producer came in and gave money, whatever, like because that kind of stuff. unfortunately, most people, when they hear a new movie, they will either look for what's the company producing it, who's in it, or who's directing it or wrote it or whatever so like they, they they need something because a lot of normal quote unquote people 
won't just give a chance on a movie that has no name, no studio, no, you know. Yeah, and so you have to draw them in with the, with the film hook instead. Well, why is this story unique? Why is it important? Because it's set during World War II, but it's set in a different perspective than we've seen before. So that could be interesting. That could be different. That's unique, you know, or whatever your unique selling point is, your, your film hook. Um, if you don't have the big names, if you don't have that kind of stuff, then you have to rely on the film hook, the story hook being the main thing to sell it, to get people interested in it and to get it sold to distributors, executives and all that, or to get funding for it in the first place with investors. But does anyone have anything to add to that about unique selling points or unique selling propositions or film hooks? Well, I feel like if that's why so many people are trying to use like IPs now because um, just actor name alone isn't cutting it anymore. Like a lot of people are going more because of the story now, because they're so tired of like the same story over and over again, or um, Hollywood actors don't have the same pull as they used to. I mean, they still do, but not to the same extent, like a huge level that they did back then. So now they're looking, what is a selling point we can use? And a lot of them are, I oh, guess. A piece, yeah. Yep. But that's we have becoming... Superman in our film. It's Superman. It doesn't matter what actor it is as much. It doesn't matter about other things. It's just whoever likes Superman, you're going to want to come see this. Yeah. And that can be one of the selling points. But that's becoming oversaturated too because they have projects that are basically name only um, or projects that are completely ruining the IP and people are oversaturated and now they want something unique. Yeah, that makes sense. I think when it comes to like selling points and things, the best way is just to like really think about it, ask opinions, and then just do it and see what kind of like reaction you'll or like interest you'll gain garner from it. Um, maybe not take it to like you know, I would say try on like a smaller scale first. It's always best. Like maybe work in like indie land with like shorts or um, unless you're like completely sold on one idea. I mean, that's one way to get feedback on how good your hook is, talk to other people. Or as oversaturated as it is, just follow the trend until it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not as a, I don't think as independent filmmakers, you should do that because in, the reason why people want to see independent films is because they're unique. They have more of a passion to them. No, I know. I was just teasing. But yeah, I agree with Sarah. And I think um, knowing your target audience, knowing your target market that you're going to try to sell this film to before you even go out to try to get investors um, is always a good thing. And we'll talk about that later this semester, but that will help you develop your log line and your selling points because your audience is teenagers. They're not going to care about the same stuff that maybe adults would. Or if your audience is women more than men, then they might care about different things than men would. And so you have to look at all of those things and then kind of um, use, like if your audience, your target market's not gonna care about the actors because it's just shown in studies and whatever else that they don't really care, then you're not, you shouldn't really care about using your unique, your big name actor as one of the main selling points as much because they're not gonna be drawing in that audience as much as you'd like. So you have to focus on what your target market, your target audience is going to want and then try to sell it to them and show the executives and the investors why this target market will like it because of this story hook or yeah. this unique selling point. And I feel like, especially in the indie scene, I've noticed that people will really gravitate towards a story that they feel like is interesting or a creator that they want to support. Like it's a lot more based on that um, in the independent scene as it is like, oh, name or big IP or whatever. It's a lot more about the story and the personality or passion behind the creators mm -hmm. more than anything, which is also really cool to see. And it's becoming more of a thing, I feel like, 
maybe around mainstream because people are just so oversaturated and tired of the formula, but maybe not. Maybe a new formula will come and oversaturate it because it just seems like there's always one formula that's. Oh, yeah, it's very popular. cyclical whenever yeah. you're talking about like the big main movies. Yeah. When people start getting sick of one thing, the next thing comes in, and then one movie does well. So then all of the movies There's try the to do craze, that. And then it was the superhero craze. And now it's the every IP ever phase. Yeah. Re, 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 re releases or not re releases, remakes. Yeah. And reworking the stories and all that. Yeah. But yeah. So there's always cycles to it. But with independent films, I feel like it's more important to show your passion and to do a story because you believe in it, not because it's something popular. It's better if you have something that's popular already that you also have a passion for. But, you, you know, it's, if you don't have a passion for a superhero film, don't try to make one as an independent filmmaker if you don't have the funding already because it's, it's going to show that you're not that passionate about it. So. Yeah, because the majority of people they want to follow in the indie scene, they want to follow people they see, they want to feel like they're supporting something. They want to feel like they're part of a movement. They want to feel like they're part of that creation of that project. And if they don't see that you're passionate about it, if they don't see that like they're part of something, it's just like, oh, it's just this thing that he wants made. It's just this thing that he wants to make money off of they won't feel as much motivation to support you and to support your project. Right. All right. Next thing we're talking about is marketability versus playability. And this stuff comes from letter C in the syllabus it's from idpanda.com. Marketability is the extent to which a film can attract an audience how marketable it is. Films are marketable only when they sound appealing to the target audience. Playability, on the other hand, is used to analyze how the film is received, what the audience experience is regarding the film when they're actually watching it. Playability is often more important than marketability as people that like it are more likely to spread the word for others to go see it, word of mouth. Oh, you have to see this film, it's so good. Um, so word of mouth can usually spread faster than marketing. Even the best marketing can be undone by bad playability and negative word of mouth. So even like a big giant cut, we've seen this before too, like where they have a huge budget for the marketing and they're, they're marketing it everywhere. Um, but the film itself isn't received well. People don't think it's that good of a movie. Then there's going to be less people going to go see it even though they've seen the ads for it, they've seen the trailer a hundred times and it looked like it might be cool. If their best friend that they trust about movies says, oh man, I went and saw the movie and it sucks, then they're not really that likely to go see it. But high playability with poor marketing still has a chance because friends and family may convince others to go see the film or the show and then it might spread out that way. That can happen a lot with independent films, but it is, it is hard when you don't have any marketing or you don't have any marketability. So you, you do technically always want both, but obviously it's going to be more marketable or more playable than, than the other. So you're always going to have a different um, ratio of those two things whenever you have a film. Some mixture of both is always going to be best as the marketability will draw in the audiences and the playability will have them spreading the word to others that it was good. This stuff comes from michaeldsellers.wordpress.com. It's later D in the syllabus. Now back then it used to be a lot more word of mouth too. Like, um, I don't remember where I saw this, but they were talking about how, oh, when you were a kid, um, your friends would come, like you'd go to school and your friends in the, would be like talking about how they went to the movies this weekend and they saw this movie and, oh, you have to watch it, it's so crazy. And then that would be the word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, now that's kind of more what it is for the indie scene because you don't have like, you, you have more, in, more individuals sharing it and talking about their experiences and sharing links and stuff like that, as opposed to like huge marketing campaigns and huge trailers, high budget trailers and that kind of thing. 
to some you're, extent, you're, yeah, I agree. I'm just saying that what I mean is your group, your audience is a lot more relevant. To, it's a lot more part of the process. Yeah, I would say with independent films, especially the playability is way more important than marketability because you're not going to be able to market it that much because you don't have a marketing budget usually. Um, and even if you get a distributor that's going to help with marketing, you don't want to give them too high of a budget to just go wild spending, um, even if it is marketable. So for independent films, especially the playability, how good the actual film is itself when people go to see it. That is more important for us as independents because the word of mouth is, is going to spread faster. It's going to get people to see that more than marketing would for an unknown company, an unknown director, an unknown actor, and all of that. Yeah, because if you have a good story, that's going to stand out from the crowd, especially nowadays where everything's so similar. Yeah. So marketability, this stuff comes from Letter D in the syllabus. Marketability is the idea of the movie. And making it sound good and make and it sounds good from an idea standpoint just hearing the idea it sounds cool it sounds interesting it sounds like you want to go see it playability is the actual execution of that film or the show and whether it's good and you can see that both ways something could be marketed terribly and like that doesn't sound like anything i'd ever want to watch but people are just like come on trust me just go see it go see it go see it and eventually you might actually go see it and you really like it and that could just mean that the marketing was off, that they were trying to market to a target audience that they thought would like the film um, when really it catered to somebody else. And that's when the marketing might have messed up. Or maybe they just didn't have much marketing, so you never even heard of it. And somebody's telling you to go see this film. That would be the playability. Where the marketability is, this movie sounds really cool. This movie sounds like it's going to be something I like. It's marketed towards me. I love this kind of film. I love that actor or whatever. And they have these marketable, you know, these unique selling points that all are something I want to go see. But then you actually go see the film and the execution of it is bad. It's the pacing is weird. The performances aren't good. There's weird cuts. The editing is might be weird. And so you just don't actually like the playability of that movie, even though it sounds like a good idea. It sounds like something that would be cool. The actual movie itself, they just didn't do it the way you were thinking in your head. Sometimes large studios are given films they know are marketable only. And those films can still be financially successful if the first weekend of the box office is big enough, which is why they still put in so much to the marketing. You know, a studio will know usually if a film's bad and they'll use what they can to market it as best they can to try to draw in as much people to get as much money from it as they can because they know once word starts spreading about it, it's not gonna be good. Um, <laughs> and TV show studios and well, networks and movie studios, they both do that. They have stuff that they know is crap or that they know is just kind of bland. But they already spent a crap ton of money on it. So, so then they, yeah, so then they spend more on marketing it because they take the risk assessment of if we market it enough, we'll get enough people to come see it opening weekend that it'll offset the cost of making it and we'll get back more than enough money than we need. They don't know it's crap yet. So let's market the crap out of it so they think it's actually good. And then by the time they figure it out, they already give us their money. Exactly. And that's, you know, big studios can do that because they have such large budgets. The contrast to this, a movie that is playable only is a problem. How do you get the bodies in the seats in the first place if you have no marketing? That's an issue with many good independent films, which is why starting small can help so that the independent producers can focus and see what works and what doesn't, as well as build a reputation for it as it rolls out. We are talking about this last semester, we were talking about distribution and how a lot of independent films will go city to city or um, they'll start small and just do like a few theaters and then start to branch out. And a main reason for this is because they don't have any marketing. So all they have is word of mouth. All they have is these reviews after the people watch the film. And if the reviews are good, they can use that to sort of market it further as they further expand. Compare that to a large studio where they just shove it out everywhere in the world all at once. Um, even if they know it's bad, 
that will get people to see it just because they want to see what this is. And it's a big, large budget, expensive movie that they've seen ads for a few times. So they go see it. Um, which is why independent filmmaking and marketing is so different from large studio marketing and, and filmmaking, because there's just so many different things that have to go into it. But as independent filmmakers, it's important to think about both playability, the quality of the script, the audio, the visuals, the performances and the story, the quality of all of those things, and the marketability to get people to come see the film. What makes it unique? The unique selling points that we're talking about. What makes it unique? What makes it stand out? What's going to make a distributor want to buy it or want to look into it more? What's going to make an investor think that this is a good thing to that has a chance to make their money back? And what's going to make somebody go, hey, that sounds like a cool movie. I'm going to go see it. You want to think about both as much as you can, and you want to try to market it as well as you can, which is why we're talking about marketing. We're going to be looking into all of these different things. The audience, the target market is important to figure out because you want to really cultivate your marketing to get the people you think will like your film in those seats as best as possible. If you only have a small marketing budget, you don't want to waste it trying to be broad and get everybody to come see it when you only think that a certain age group or a certain ethnicity or a certain region of people will like it it's a local virginia film so virginians will probably like it more than or somebody in california genre that you know some people will like and some don't like horror not everyone likes horror so instead of just sending it out to everyone send it out specifically to people who are horror fans right and so you start marketing it based on those things which we'll get into later this semester more in depth but you start trying to cultivate that marketing to the specific group of people that you really think are going to like it. And that group of people could be made up of any different number of different um, differentiations. It's not all about race. It's not all about age. There's many different things like you could have two people, two teenagers going to the same school in the same place, one like sci-fi and the other one doesn't. And so you can cultivate your marketing to the sci-fi kid by you know, using different keywords and different things to market it to him when he's going on Google and he's looking up sci-fi movies near me, yours can be one of the ones that pop up if you're spending your money on that kind of thing. So there's a bunch of different things we can do as independents to try to market it to our specific target market, our target audience. But that's why it's so important to figure that out beforehand. But beyond that, you don't wanna just have a film that is playable. You want to be able to market it too. What makes it stand apart? It should have something that makes it unique, makes somebody want to watch it, as well as just be a really good film. But you also want to think about the playability and make sure that from that standpoint, you've done everything you can to make it the best film that it can be um, with the budget that you have, of course. But does anybody have anything to add or comments or anything on that marketability versus playability? All right, well, next thing we're studying is going to be Thursday. We're going to be talking about key art and posters, which is another one of your main selling points, both for the pitch and for the marketing. It's what draws the oh. attention of everybody and gets them to look at it and go, hey, that looks like a cool film. So we'll be talking a lot about that. Uh, we'll talk about behind the scenes photos and videos, why they're important and how they can help with an independent um, production production stills, film proposals, and that'll be Thursday's meeting. So appreciate everybody for coming in. And uh, yeah, that was and, awesome. yeah, hopefully you guys have a good week and I'll see you guys on Thursday. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night.